Hello everyone and welcome to Jojolian chapter 72 review, the final chapter of the year. So, happy new years guys, it looks like we're closing out 2017 with a Jojolian chapter review. So chapter 72, we're just coming off Yasuo's flashback and the last thing we saw was Jobin burying Ozone Baby. So my expectations for this uh, chapter right here were the beginning of the next arc and possibly a confrontation between Jobin and poor Tom and his stand Ozone Baby against Mamazuku and Josuke. Everyone was going to be arriving at the Josuke, uh, the Higashikata estate, and there was going to be some sort of confrontation. And I was most excited to see Jobin turn into sort of a villain character and actually become an antagonist to Josuke and Rei, who are pretty much our uh, main characters right now. Or Rai, not Rei, sorry. But as most of you guys no, because I'm pretty late this month on the chapter review. I'm sorry about that. I always get like deathly ill after Christmas every single year. I should just expect it from now on, but I'm slowly recovering from, uh, I think it was a sinus infection. Gross stuff. But anyways, um, my expectations for this chapter, like I said, uh, Jobin turned into a villain fighting against Mamazuku and Josuke, but... My expectations were completely thrown for a loop this chapter, but we will talk more about Jobin's unexpected protagonist role in this arc later on in the chapter. But like every month, let's start off with the beginning. In this month, we have an Ultra Jump magazine cover. I feel like Jojo Ling gets the cover of Ultra Jump like 10 months out of the year. I think it is sort of their highlight series. I don't even know anything else that's in Ultra Jump. I don't really read a lot of other uh, shonen series, let alone monthly seinen series. So let's start off with the Ultra Jump cover. Um, it's really simple. It's not full colored or anything. It's just kind of an overlay with a reddish pink and also a greenish yellow and slight character design changes like Mamazuku wearing a scarf and Josuke having some different pins on his outfit, a soft and wet patch on his right arm and also a good moniker with a Rokakaka under it. Just, just slight changes that Araki will do for covers and stuff, changing up the designs and Yasuo wearing long sleeves, uh, long sleeves rather than a tank top. And also you can see the, uh, harvest animal bug things, whatever they were, the larva that that uh, Mamazuku is going to use to speed up their Okakaka harvest process. Um, the container for them is right underneath his feet. So um, the Ultra Jump cover is very similar to the cover page. We'll get onto the cover page right now. And uh, although cover pages are pretty much just Araki doodling whatever, they do have some symbolism within the uh, of the current chapters. Obviously, they have their narrative text. Like right now, this month is which. Uh, will they arrive at first the harvest or despair will they fail will they, will they fail or will they succeed um and also you see a vehicle in the background which is actually pretty important because uh the traveling between hanarero mountain back to the higashikata estate happens off screen so later in the chapter after we see uh the introduction and how jobin goes about burying ozone baby we see that josuke and mamazuku just sort of arrive at the estate and they appear in the underground tunnels uh sort of in surugi's living space separate from the higashikata estate so Based on this cover page, we can assume that they drove a vehicle from Hanarero Mountain back into Morio. So, just small details like that. And also, we learn later in this chapter, we'll get onto all of this, sorry I'm spoiling it, but you guys, I'm, I'm, I'm sure all you guys that watch these videos have been keeping up to Joe Jolien and read these chapters as soon as they come out, or at least you should be. Um, so, we see that Yasuo is walking away, and Mamazuku and Josuke are sticking together, and that symbolizes that Yasuo in the chapter leaves the group, and Mamazuku and Josuke stay. So, just slight things in the cover page. I'm probably going into it too much, but we also get the name of the current arc. It is Poor Tom and Ozone Baby Part 1. But getting on to the beginning of the chapter, starting with the first page, and the first thing we see is a countdown start, which is very significant. We'll talk about that uh, more the next time we see it. It says, Time until harvest of the Rokakaka fruit. Two days, four hours, and 33 minutes, and a picture of the Rokakaka. The moment is fast approaching. So this sort of picks up the pace of the this uh, current arc that's going on and makes things feel a little bit more tense. But like a lot of chapters in between the arcs, we get a bit of a cool down, and we see the Higashikata family again. And... I really hate sort of how Araki has gone about integrating the Higashikata family into Jojolian. Like, they're the, this awesome uh, family who are so close and, you know, so uh, so naive how they're stand users, but they're really immature people like Kato, not Kato, but Hato, Daya, and Joshu. Like, they're like spoiled kids kind of that come from a rich family. I don't know. I feel like they were really poorly integrated into the end of the part. I don't know what else he can do with them. We're already in the late or we're in the early 70s. Um, I could really only see Joe Jillian going on for 20 to 30 more chapters, but, uh, it seems like in between a lot of arcs, sort of in between like vitamin C and everything, we'll just see the Higashikata family like around, especially in the earlier parts of Joe Jillian, like in between every minor villain, we would just see the family doing stuff. And then the next fight, like in between, o uh, Ojiro, I think his name was fun, fun, fun's user, Higashikata family moment, then die, Higashikata family moment, and then born this way. It just got so repetitive. And we see that trend happening again. 
Um, we see the family all together, Daya, Joshua, and Hato. Like, good morning, Daddy, talking to Narisuke. We just see uh, Joshu being Joshu. <laughs> Narisuke is like, hey, what are you doing this morning? And we see Joshu, like, analyzing. He has a scale, and he, like, he has, like, a, a measurement scale, and he also has a ruler, and he's measuring out the fish sausages, and he's like, I'm, am I getting scammed by this store? They say it's a, they say it's a bargain, because you get two extra ones, but he's, like, measuring them and comparing them to the other ones. So, just Joshu being Joshu, guys. And that goes on for, like, three panels. Um... But one thing to make note of at the beginning of this chapter is that we have gone back in time uh, a few minutes, I assume, from the uh, last chapter. The last thing we saw was Jobin burying Ozone Baby, but now we see him walking through the house going uh, towards burying Ozone Baby. The first thing Riske says is, whose bag is this? And it's actually the bag that Ozone Baby is in, and we see Jobin pick it up. And this also sort of symbolizes how, like segregated Jobin is from the rest of the family. Um, the way how all the family's talking together, we see Narisuke like reading the paper with his glasses on. You know, everyone's drinking their morning uh, coffee and just having breakfast. The whole family's together. Even Kyo's there. But we just see Jobin walking away from them, just pale faced, didn't say anything to any family members. So um, this can sort of be symbolizing his uh, break away from the family, how he's not really participating in anything like that. But um, just interesting thing to take note of. So he goes deeper into the house and he goes to what looks like uh, is the equipment to uh, disable the surveillance gear. Um, at first I thought it was like a washing machine. I was like, what is this? But uh, Jobin's just sort of bent down here and you can see some knobs and some panels and what just looks like technology um, with an open window in front of him. And we learn later in the chapter, uh, poor Tom told uh, Jobin to disable the camera. So this is what he's doing right now. Now, after this, we get thrown into a flashback of Jobin and Narisuke at a baseball game, which is a pretty significant moment that tells us it, it sort of just reinforces Jobin's motive, kind of how he wants to, you know, make the Higashikata fruit parlor prosper. And even if it's not uh, going by the traditions and what they've always been doing, he wants the fruit company to be successful, even if it means doing illegal things, because Jobin is naive, like most of the Higashikata family, and he's very immature and doesn't think about things. Uh, like like their father does. Narisuke is definitely the most wise and the most reasonable out of the entire family. And you can see almost the antithesis of that in all of his family members like Joshu and Jobin. So there's good contrast and good duality between the Higashikata family. But we see uh, Jobin... And Narisuke talk about how, you know, the parlor's not doing as good. There's other uh, places popping up. And that and Jobin uh, suggests that we need to import fruits that are cheaper and taste good. Not so much higher quality that we've been using. So pretty much just cut costs. Uh, make it so we don't have to pay as much money. We don't have to get as fresh a fruit, but they will taste just as good. And we'll make more money. And Narisuke is just like, no, we're not doing that. We are going to do things how we always have. We are going to use fresh fruit. We are going to use good products and we are going to make healthy and, you know, just good fruit that comes from a good place and is organic and everything. And Jobin thinks that Narisuke is living in the past and he's an old timer and uh, uh, that is not what's good for the business. When Jobin is sort of, yeah, you know, he's sort of turned into like the, uh, like a corrupt businessman who just wants to cut costs and, you know, doesn't really care about the product or the customers, just wants to make as much money and be as profitable as possible. After Narisuke sort of storms off and he says, a fruit shop doesn't need to be powerful as you know J Narisuke doesn't care how much money it makes he just wants it to he wants to be proud of his business and he wants to keep doing things he, he always has so um we see Jobin pissed off again and he says I like how he says how is this fun that's no summer vacation it sort of uh reinforces Jobin's um view on life and uh, how he wants every day and everything to feel like he's on summer vacation and just have a, a good time all of the time, as we can see in the way he chooses to spend his money and his lifestyle, buying Lamborghinis, um, you know, still living at home. It's just, he, he's a man child. That's all Jobin is, really. So other than this flashback, just reinforcing Jobin's motives and his ideals, how every day should be like summer vacation and how you are starting at zero when you're born and you have to strive upwards. That was introduced uh, in the Blue Hawaii arc. How he says, I don't want to be left behind with these people. Um, we also see how he was introduced and was brought into the Rokakaka trade as it seems like Yotsuyu and the other rock humans were trying to find a sort of front to launder uh, the money and everything that was the, that they were going to make through the Rokakaka. Uh, they just needed someone that had an in in the fruit business or whatever. And the Rokakaka is like an ancient fruit that is very expensive and has equivalent exchange powers. So the perfect front to sell this would be through a fruit parlor. So they sort of used Jobin as a tool to get in with them as Yotsuyu already worked his way into the Higashikata family by being the architect for Narisuke, but then he realized that Jobin is someone that would perfectly would be a perfect person uh, to be able to uh, 
utilize the fruit parlor for the Rokakaka exchange. And we see Yotsuyu with the Doobie Waz user and the Aphex brothers first introduced to Jobin, and that's sort of how he got involved uh, with using the fruit parlor uh, as a front for the Rokakaka trade. So we come out of that flashback and we are put into the Higashikata family orchard right about where chapter 71 left off with Jobin burying Ozone Baby. And you see the dialogue from poor Tom that says you should probably shut off the security cameras and that is back when uh, Jobin was in front of the window. He was shutting off the cameras going to bury Ozone Baby. And we see Jobin right before he buries it and he says I'm doing this for the Higashikata family. Jobin thinks what he's doing is right but little does he know he is going to end up hurting someone very close to him. But we now switch scenes over to Josuke and Mamazuku, and they have arrived in the underground tunnels outside of the Higashikata State in Surugi's living areas. Like I said, there was a bit of a time skip in between the Hanarero Mountain and them traveling back into Morio. They probably took that car that was in the cover page, but here we are, and we see the text again on the top of the screen that says, Time until harvest of the Rokakaka. And time's gone down a little bit. We still have two days, but only two hours and 11 minutes now. So I think that this timer right here, um, I don't want to say it's going to signify the rest of Jojolian, but it kind of screams end times with this timer right here and the Rokakaka. Um, I think it will probably take up uh, the rest of the Ozone Baby arc, which will probably be three to four parts uh, to poor Tom and Ozone Baby, because we see later once Mamazuku and Josuke actually um, successfully put the, uh, I don't know if they're larvae exactly, but put the the animals that are uh, stimulating the branch and they're going to make the Rokakaka harvest faster. Uh, Josuke and Mamazuku say that they need to just wait for that to happen for two days. So they actually initiate it in this chapter and it is two days until the Rokakaka is actually grown. So I think those two days will mostly just be the Ozone Baby Arc. And after that, we will have the Rokakaka actually created in this new fruit. And I think that is when conflict is really going to start to happen because the physical object of the new Rokakaka is going to be in someone's hands. Who those hands are going to be, we don't know yet, but I think that is going to just be, at first I was like, oh my gosh, Jojolian is going to take place in this time frame right here, these two days, but I think that's just going to be the Ozone uh, baby arc, which is going to be encapsulated within these two days, but getting onto it, we just see Josuke and Mamazuku going throughout the tunnels, trying to make their way to the branch. Other than just minor dialogue like that, we get something pretty significant of Mamazuku talking about Yasuo and how she left them. As you guys have noticed, Yasuo has not been in this chapter yet. She went back home to find the hair clip. Last time we saw it was when Kiri Yoshikage stepped on it in her flashback, but I guess she kept it and she's had it for like five years now. It's just been sitting. I think uh, Mamazuku says specifically, um, it's been broken for five or six years. So it's really nice because when we were introduced to Doremi Fasolati Do, I was like, dude, what the hell is a rock animal? A rocky, are you kidding me? Like rock humans, and, and now there's just rock animals here that have things that are like stand abilities, but just are in nature. Like the hair clip was able to like create memories and affect someone's brain, and Doremi was able to ha have, you know, vast physical effects on the landscape with its tracks, but it's like they're not stand users. Um, what is the supernatural power that rock animals have? So that is going to get explained because don't forget, Yasuo has a stand called Paisley Park that we haven't seen in a long time that actually is able to analyze things and reveal the truths uh, within things. So Yasuo is going back to her house to analyze the hair clip and hopefully she will come back with some information that Mamazuku says will tell us more about not just the rock animals, but uh, the rock humans as well and their origins. So that's interesting. Well, hopefully we'll get some lore uh, from Yasuo and Paisley Park on where these things originated from and more about them. So with that explained, Josuke and Mamazuku open up a hatch and they see the orchard. They have finally come here. Uh, ever since like the Blue Hawaii arc, we have been waiting for Mamazuku to get to the orchard and he's finally here. And the first second he looks at the orchard, he's like, right there. It's the second branch from the right. Memorize it. Like, I love how he's just like an expert of his craft. And um, so Mamazuku finds the branch and he pulls out the, those lar larva things again. I gotta find what these things are called, dude. What are these? They look like like little dragons. Like they have like an open mouth and like little wings coming off them. But whatever. Their their job is just to get into the branch, stimulate them, and you know sort of uh, ex expedite the growing process of the Rokakaka. And that's what they're doing. They were really successful with. It. They had absolutely no trouble, um, which makes sense because Mamazuku was able to go into the tunnels. He knows certain ways around it. And I mean the uh, the objective didn't seem that difficult just get to the orchard and they did it and mamazuku uses doggy style and uh transfers those little animals bugs larvae whatever they are onto the branch and mission accomplished easy as that i think this has been the first time in jojoli and there's been an actual goal and the main characters achieve it with no with no like 
uh, trials or anything like that. Like they have an objective and they did it that easily. So now Mamazuku says to Josuke that it's going to take two days and that's where the timer comes in. So two days until that Rokakaka is going to grow and then we can harvest it. So Mamazuku and Josuke say that they're just going to wait. They're just going to hide out. They're not going to do anything. They haven't been spotted yet. No one knows. The security cameras are off. Jobin didn't see anything. Uh, unless it's been, it hasn't been revealed, but unless another family member saw them, but I don't think they did. Uh, no one knows that they have initiated the growing process of the uh, branch unless poor Tom knows because we got some dialogue uh, later like right after this where Jobin's like I wonder where poor Tom is in this whole situation is he watching from the orchard is he even around the estate at all because it stands automatic but if you guys remember poor Tom may or may not have omnipient uh, all-knowing powers based on the lyrics of the song uh, poor Tom seventh son always knows what's going on and it was referenced in chapter 70 I think when poor Tom was introduced that he is all knowing and that he pretty much is able to know everything. Um, it also ties into the musical reference. So I don't know if that was just a Rocky, uh, you know, doing a callback to the reference or poor Tom actually has an ability like this. So the only person I could see that knows that the Rokakaka is being harvested is poor Tom. So Josuke and Mamazuku say they're going to hide out. I doubt that they're probably going to get involved in the Ozone baby fight in some way. So now we move over to Jobin, which is some really interesting dialogue. He says, I wonder where that poor Tom guy is. He says, I have no idea what the ability is that I just buried. Uh, he buried the model replica White House that is Ozone baby, but he just knows that, uh, what does he say? He says that I buried, but if Josuke or the plant appraiser uh, get within its range, they'll die. But we see later what Ozone baby really does, and it's... Ability, we know what its physical ability is, but we don't really know how it's activated. Um, but we'll get on to that later. And we see uh, Jobin actually questioning things that a lot of us, the readers, have been questioning. It was really nice that he did this. I, I mean, like, Jobin is actually, like, it it's a logical thing to ask. He says, speaking of which, how does poor Tom intend to get his hands on the Rokakaka fruit? If he ends up killing the plant appraiser, then winter will come and the branch will wilt. Um, what is his plan? So based on what we know about poor Tom already, he's like an all-knowing person. Uh, if you look at his musical reference and the symbolism we got in chapter 70, poor Tom is looking at Josuke and Mamazuku. He knows that they initiated the harvest process. So poor Tom probably knows that it's going to be harvested in two days. So he is waiting until then. And once it's harvested and uh, Mamazuku actually gets the branch, then poor Tom and Ozone Baby will probably come in and take it from them. But this is just wild speculation at this point. It'd be almost impossible to, for me to accurately predict something as specific as that happening. That's just sort of my own uh, theorizing on what's going on. Because poor Tom has to have some sort of a plan. It's even foreshadowed right here that we don't know what it is and it is something. So I assume he knows when the Rokakaka is going to begin to grow and he's going to wait for Mamazuku to harvest it. And then we come into the final act of the chapter, which is probably the most uh, significant part of it, where Surugi comes in. We haven't seen Surugi in a hell of a long time and looking derpy as ever with his rock dog. Uh, Surugi is so hilarious. I love whenever Rocky draws him. Sometimes he will be like, like just like embarrassingly cute or he'll just look absolutely stupid and just draw him in the ugliest way possible. Right now, this is one of the uglier ways that Rocky has drawn Sarugi just showing up. It's like, hey daddy, what are you doing? And it's really nice seeing a Sarugi and Jobin interaction because I don't think we have ever in Jojolian seen Sarugi talk to Jobin before. Isn't that weird when you think about that? Like they're father and son, but when has Sarugi ever had like a actual scene where he's talked to Jobin? I think it was, um, no, that was when the Risuke. It must have been in the Doobie Wah arc. They must have had some interaction then, but uh, this was really nice, just seeing Sarugi and his father talk again. And now we see sort of maybe how uh, Ozone Baby will activate. And again, we get the time going. Uh, it's really interesting seeing this timer click down because it's going in very small intervals. We see two days, two hours, and two minutes now. So we only went down like nine minutes there, which is weird. Uh, so I don't know how important that timer is going to be if we're going to see it almost like every other page, but only nine minutes have gone down, but Iraqi felt it was necessary for us to show us that nine minutes have passed. Maybe he wants to have us, maybe he wants us, the readers, to have a really good grasp on uh, the time frame of everything that's happening, but uh, we just see Surugi questioning Jobin, asking him what's going on, and Surugi... Like I said, a family member is going to get involved in, in Ozone Baby. It's taking place right next to the Nagashikata estate. I said once Ozone Baby activates, it's going to affect members of the Nagashikata family, whether it be Josuke or whether it be uh, Joshu, Kato, uh, Hato, these stupid names, uh, Daya, whichever one of them. 
uh, we all pretty much saw it was inevitable, it was foreshadowed, that one of the members of the Higashikata family is going to be an innocent bystander and get hurt during this arc. But for some reason, it has to be uh, Sarugi, like my favorite member of the family that does nothing wrong and is already about to suffer from the rock disease and is like perfectly innocent. They are the one that gets affected by Ozone Baby. It's like, come on, Araki, you fuck. Like, why do you got to do this, dude? How, why, why can't Joshu like actually get in a fight with his perfectly fine, uh, perfectly viable stand? Uh, not King Call and see more of that. Or why can't we see more of Hato's stand when she gets attacked? Of course, it has to be Sarugi, but this, uh, it, it kind of makes sense for it to be Sarugi because Sarugi is Jobin's son and it gives Jobin a reason to take on a protagonist role and protect uh, his immediate family, like his child. It, like if it was Joshua or something, I feel like it'd be easier for Jobin uh, not to care as much if it was his brother, but since it's, it's, it's his son, it's really close to him. So Sarugi's just questioning him saying, are you doing bad things? Like, I saw you turn off the security cameras, and I saw you sneaking around, and I saw you burying this thing. And uh, Surugi brings up Yotsuyu, which Yotsuyu was really close to Surugi, if you guys remember way back in the uh, um, I Am a Rock arc. But Jobin just assures that everything that he is doing, he can't reveal everything, he can't really tell Surugi what's going on, but all he's saying is that it is in your best interest. And we get some interesting dialogue as well. Um, them talking about the rock disease and the way they pass it. Jobin says, when daddy was just a bit older than you, um, not older than you are, he got sick. Uh, and the one that set me on the road to getting better was your grandma Kato. And he explains that when that time happens for Surugi, Jobin will be the one that will sacrifice himself. And, uh, and he says, and if someday you get sick too, it comes, then daddy will be the one to cure you. I promise I will. So I don't know if that's Jobin directly saying that he will sacrifice himself for Sarugi, because that doesn't really seem in line with Jobin's character. We really haven't seen him show a lot of affection for his family, and uh, I mean, he's seen that uh, Kato was able to take someone else's life to save his own. So I don't know if Jobin is directly saying that he will sacrifice himself, or he will use someone else to exchange the rock disease with. I doubt Jobin would be that selfless. So Surugi brings up a rock human. He says, you were friends with Yotsuyu before. Did you do something bad? So it's been theorized be, uh, by people around the community that Ozone Baby is like a mixture between Bites the Dust and Stray Cat. And it's just like all of these callbacks from part four just melded into one stand. Um, I don't think like everything needs to be a direct alternative to something else. I think Ozone Baby is just itself, but it is interesting uh, to see when it activated as it did. Like as soon as, uh, so Jobin buried it and some time had passed, nine minutes had passed. Maybe that was why Araki wanted to tell us that. Um, but when Surugi starts questioning Jobin, when Surugi's like, are you doing something bad? What are you doing? That is when Ozone Baby decides to activate. So... I don't think it has a similar ability to Bites of the Dust, how once someone questions you or once, uh, you know, someone is onto what you're doing, it activates. That doesn't seem a bit, that just seems unreasonable. I think Ozone Baby was just a coincidence that it activated at this point in time. But as we can see, the ability starts to take effect and it's really simple. It's pretty much just, it just affects air pressure. Uh, we can pretty much tell that right from the, this, this final act of this chapter. Uh, really simple stand, almost disappointingly simple. We see Jobin's nose starts to bleed, all the cans in the garage start to crack, uh, and as soon as the, uh, the door is opened, the rock dog steps outside, and the air pressure in that room just brings the dog to a crash. As you can see, like if there's different air pressures and you open a door, you're going to be affected by either, um, you know, your ears are just going to explode or something, or uh, you're going to get blown away. And we see Ozone Baby do this weird thing, how... Um, when the door opens, it sort of it, it lifts up its, its, its arms and the rock dog just gets absolutely destroyed. I hope the rock dog's not dead, um, but Araki killing dogs again. <laughs> Same old Araki. It said, Araki has said before that the reason why he, uh, you know, sort of does so many bad things to dogs is because he thinks dogs are so pure and a lot of people like dogs, so... Whenever an enemy does something bad to a dog, like Dio or anything like that, it's because uh, he wants them to come off as extra evil. So I don't know if poor Tom is going to be set up to be like this really menacing villain, but that's just a minor thing to take note of. But let's talk about Ozone Baby's design. This thing is really weird looking. It is on wheels. It sort of has a similar uh, torso to like Jobin, and it has Ozone Baby across its face. It sort of reminds me of a mixture between like Jobin's design and Goo Goo Dolls. Really weird looking. And same with, uh, it sort of has, um, 
Mamazuku's doggy styles uh, drapes coming down from its shoulders. Just a weird st uh, stand design. I don't know if it's just me, but lately in JoJolian, I really haven't been digging a lot of the stand designs. Uh, the only great stand designs in JoJolian are like, I want to say King Nothing, Soft and Wet, Cut Nut King Call, but a lot of the recent ones like Doggy Style, Ozone Baby, Blue Hawaii, they've all just been really, really heavy letdowns. Like I haven't liked a stand design in a really long time. Uh, Urban Gorilla didn't even have a physical design. It was just the, uh, the shapes, but Ozone Baby is a really weird looking dude. And I'm really confused on this stand as well. Araki has set up guidelines for certain stands, but it seems like everything is just breaking. Stands have stopped making sense a long time ago, especially in Jojolian. Uh, things seem like they're getting really messy. Uh, one question I had was, why does Doggy Style have a physical appearance? Doggy Style's physical form doesn't do anything. It just appears whenever Mamazuku activates uh, it with his body. So it seems weird for Doggy Style to have a physical uh, design when it's an integrated stand with Mamazuku's body. And another issue I had with Doggy Style this chapter, speaking of him, is that as much as I love Doggy Style and I think it's a really interesting stand, um, I'm kind of really disappointed how uncreative it is because in this chapter, when Mamazuku used it and he said he activated, he said Doggy Style, and it went and uh, set those animals on the branch. I was like, dude, like. This is just stone free. Like, there is no difference between doggy style and stone free. Stone free can just do everything doggy style can, but better, as it has a humanoid form and it has way more physical attributes to it. It's just, I don't know. Like, the point of stand abilities were that every single one is different and they're so creative, but I've been really let down by doggy style. Everything we've seen it do, it's like, it's just stone free. And what is the connection between that? Obviously, Araki likes to make connections between the old universe and the base universe. I mean, look at Steel Ball Run. It's just full of references. And same with uh, Part 8. Obviously, Killer Queen is pretty much the same stand with slight variations as Killer Queen in the original universe. And the users are both Yoshikage Kira. So, I mean, if I was Araki, it, I don't know how he couldn't realize that he's just making Stone Free again. But what is the connection between Jolene and Mamazuku and Doggy Style and Stone Free? I just don't get it at all. He's it, it, We've seen that he does the same exact stand, but they have a connection. They have the same stand user and they have the same name. Killer Queen in the base universe blows things up. It has, a, it has the same design as Part 8 and its, and its user is Kira. In Part 8, user is Kira. It blows things up. It has the same design. I'm just really confused on Doggy Style. It's very similar to Stone Free, but it seems to have no connections to it. And I'm to the point where I'm kind of let down and I'm considering Doggy Style an unoriginal stand. Which kind of sucks, because Mamazuku is a really cool character. So that's sort of a rant I've been wanting to go on but, uh, about Doggy Style for a long time. Um, the exact description for Doggy Style is that it sort of like stretches and the material's a bit different than Strain, but just the way Mamazuku uses it, it's just stone free with slightly more range, I guess. The way he can turn his body into Strain. Um, I don't know. I don't like seeing stand abilities that we've already seen before. Um, but getting on to the final bits of this chapter right here, we see that... Uh, Surugi takes a pretty serious hit from Ozone Baby and uh, almost fatal maybe. We see blood coming out of Surugi's ears, his eyes, and also his mouth and nose. So I hope nothing serious happened to Surugi, but this is Jobin's turning point right here. Uh, Jobin, for the rest of this arc, I think it's mostly going to be Jobin against uh, poor Tom and Ozone Baby, sort of trying to protect uh, Surugi. There's not a lot of ways I can even predict this, chap this arc to go. Um, I mean, what? Jobin teams up with poor Tom to attack Josuke and Mamazuku, but then Jobin just immediately turns on poor Tom and fights him. It just seems really weird how all of this is happening and what Jobin's role is going to be in this arc, but all I can tell from this is that I really hope he takes on some sort of a protagonist role and works against Ozone Baby. But then again, that just seems like, it seems really stagnant and there's not going to be a lot of plot progression. Like, okay, Jobin gets in a fight with, Jobin teams up with poor Tom. Then Jobin fights poor Tom. It's like, I, I don't know. Um, they're, I, like, I thought there were supposed to be teams because, like, isn't Jobin's musical reference, like, Tom Jobin? So they sort of fit together, but now they're going to fight each other. I don't know. It's weird. I don't know how this is going to happen, but... Uh, Jobin is going to need to protect Surugi in some way, and I doubt he is going to like uh, poor Tom and o Ozone Baby much after this, but my predictions are that Josuke and Mamazuku, I doubt they're just going to sit around for two days. I bet they will get involved in Ozone Baby in some way. But as for now, Ozone Baby seems to be just another minor villain, and we're going to see Jobin, rather than attacking, uh, he's going to be protecting his family and being more of a protagonist. So 
Uh, like I said, this chapter really threw me for a loop. I thought we were going to see a fight between Jobin and one of the main cast members, but I guess that is not going to be the case. So, um, really disappointed, actually. Seems really stagnant. Uh, what I thought was going to be massive plot progression turned into just a minor villain arc where Jobin is going to uh, be fighting against someone he originally teamed up with. But who knows? There's really no way to predict this shit. I don't know what's going on inside of Rocky's head. No one does. Um, but anyways, guys, thank you all for watching Chapter 72 Review. Those are my thoughts on the chapter. Disappointing. I have some issues with Doggy Style. And also, before I go, can we talk about Ozone Baby's design real quick? Why does Ozone Baby have two appearances? This doesn't make sense. Stands are just nonsense now. Ozone Baby was originally introduced as a model replica White House. Was that model replica White House... Uh, it seemed to be a stand itself because when we first saw poor Tom, he didn't have it and then it appeared out of nowhere. So he is able to manifest and unmanifest the stand. The stand is not bound to anything. It's not bound to a model replica of the White House. It is able to be uh, demanifested and manifested by will. But now we see that Ozone Baby has another appearance that is a, like almost a humanoid type stand with a face. So I guess Ozone Baby is just a stand with two appearances. It makes absolutely no sense. It's like nothing we've seen in the series before. So I don't know if this is just a new stand type or it's just an inconsistency, but I don't like how Ozone Baby has like two designs. It's weird. Um, anyways, uh, I'm kind of giving off negative vibes for this chapter. It's just, I feel like Joe Jolian's getting really messy. And I mean, the Urban Gorilla fight was cool and everything and the chapters have been good lately, but this current arc right now, what seemed to be like massive plot progression going into sort of the climax of the series looks like it's going to end up being a minor villain fight and just really stagnant. And we have to wait uh, two days until we get more plot progression in manga time, which who knows how long that'll go on. And as well as Joe Jolene is going to take a hiatus next month, so we won't get a chapter until February, which sucks balls. But anyways, guys, thank you all for watching Joe Jolene Chapter 72 Review. Those are my thoughts. A lot to talk about with this chapter. Let me know in the comment section down below. And let me know what you guys think about uh, Ozone Baby and all these weird things happening with Joe Jolene right now. All right. Thank you all for watching. Happy New Year again, everyone. And uh, yeah, like, subscribe, all that good stuff. I will see you all later. Okay. Double peace.